Hello and welcome to the first feature episode of the Full Time Whittle podcast in 2021. After a great debut year in 2020, we are starting right where we left off with another fantastic and insightful guest. Former Northern Ireland international Roy Carroll joins us on the podcast to discuss his decorated 34-year playing career where he featured for the likes of Wig Athletic, West Ham United, Manchester United and Olympiacos. From talking about winning the Premier League and the FA Cup to his infamous moment against Tottenham Hotspur, Roy has some great tales to share. The Northern Irishman also opens up about his battle with depression and alcohol addiction. He bravely went into detail about his struggles and the emotion going through that to join Northern Ireland on their exciting European Championship campaign in 2016. Roy is a fantastic guest and I really hope everyone enjoys his episode. If you are new to the podcast, please subscribe to my channel. It is much appreciated as over 81% of viewers are not currently subscribed. So if you can kindly press that subscribe button, it'll be much appreciated. So now without further ado, no more rambling for myself. This is a full time with the podcast with Roy Carroll. So uh, first and foremost, Roy, it would make sense to start the podcast where it all began for you. So what was it like for you to grow up in Northern Ireland? Yeah, it was like a normal life. Uh, young players, uh, kids playing out in the park, playing football and uh, playing every sport you can. Uh, I was only 15, 16 when I started playing against men and uh, enjoyed playing in goals. When I, I just turned 14 years old and I started being serious about go- being being a goalkeeper. And uh, as all goalkeepers, they, were, they think they're great strikers. I was a, a striker until I was about 13, 14 and decided to be a keeper. And uh, it just went from there. Uh, it just went so quick. And as as uh, when you get older, you know how time goes so quick when you get older. And uh, when I was a young lad, just wanted to be a professional footballer. It's uh, the dream of many people. And, and what was your childhood like? Because I know during the time uh, in Northern Ireland, there was a period of conflict known as the Troubles. Yeah, it was. Um, it was uh, the Troubles back then was uh, pretty serious and. A lot of problems happening. Like, just have to be careful what you what you're doing and uh, what's happening. Especially when I looked from Ellisgillen and uh, you had the Ellisgillen bombing. What happened uh, just down the road, which was scary at the time. I was only ten years old. I remember very clearly. Uh, the windows in the house were shaking when it, uh, the explosion went off. But uh, uh, we were growing up. We were growing up with it. And uh, I've explained to many many people in my in my career all over the, all over Europe. Like, we we. we we just had to, to get on with life and we enjoyed life and that's what we all did as young lads and uh, young kids was just want to go out and enjoy playing football on the pitch and uh, even in the, in the park and enjoying uh, like I said before and the troubles were bad but uh, 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 everything's been quite good since I've moved back home to Northern Ireland. Was football very much an escape for you back then as a child from the troubles? I think uh, I think it was and it wasn't. If you know what I mean, it's one of those situations when you're a young lad, you're growing up with it. So I was born in uh, '77, so uh, I was growing up uh, with it uh, when I was a young per- young lad, and I just thought it was a normal life. Uh, that's that's the truth. I know you might people may think, oh, what are you on about, like uh, the, the bombing and the killings and stuff like that. There, for me, it was just uh, as a young lad, you thought that's the way life was. But for me, football and I played everything. Played rugby. Played. Uh, played cricket, I played basketball and uh, all my mates would just get on with life and that's what it was like back in them days. That's a really great answer and obviously you mentioned you played a variety of sports, obviously a very sporty individual when you were young, but when did you realise that you were going to become a professional footballer? Well, it was, uh, it was. I just always wanted to be one. Uh, you're watching TV and my hero was Pat Jennings, watching him uh, especially watching his old videos when he was playing in the World Cups and stuff like that there. I just wanted to be a goalkeeper. It was very difficult. Where I live, uh, not too many people know where County Fermanagh is and Ellis Gillen. It's, uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. And uh, not many scouts would have came down past uh, uh, out of Belfast at them days. And Belfast was about 70, 80 miles away. And uh, for me, the opportunity was playing for Balamalad, who was playing in a higher league. Uh, for the men's, on the, I was there at 16 years old, and when I started getting playing against men and enjoying it, and a lot of people was talking about me how how decent was I was, but I just enjoyed playing the game and I just loved playing in goals. And one day I was lucky enough I got spotted by um, a scout in Belfast when I played in Belfast against a team called Dundella, and the opportunity just went from there. And I just like any. There's many, many young players in, in Fermanagh who always wanted to be a professional football, never quite made it because 
the opportunity never turned up for them. So for me, you need to have a bit of luck as well, Jay. You know what I mean? Football, you need to have a bit. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And 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 back then in 1995, I was quite lucky in the right place at the right time. Yeah, it was a great way for you to get spotted. And in your answer there, you mentioned that you looked up to Pat Jennings. And I believe that Pat Jennings was part of the coaching team at Northern Ireland. Uh, what was it like to work with Pat, an idol for it yourself was, growing up? It was good. It was brilliant. Uh, he was, uh, I think, my first two or three minutes I was training with him. Uh, the ball hit me in the face about five times because I wasn't <laughs> concentrating. I was, that, I was that nervous. And he, he was my hero and he was serving me volleys. And uh, I think the first... Uh, five to six balls hit in the face but uh he was he was a gentleman as well he's really down the earth and uh, it was a it was i was just over the moon i was a young lad and uh it was just so uh it was it was just unreal if you understand especially when you when you're young young lad uh looking up to your hero and next minute he's standing in front of you take teaching you goalkeeping training what did you learn from pat i've, I've just learned how how well uh he for for the for the how big he is and uh, the clubs he played for, how well he's just down the earth. You know what I mean? He was just down the earth, and and that's stuck in my head for a long, long time. How well he is and the way he spoke to you, and uh, I learned from Big Pat. Uh, like when what you look back and you see goalkeeping this day and age, and you look back when he was playing, he was just coming out catching the ball with one hand. You know what I mean? There was no te- there was technique them days. It was just coming out. You try and catch the ball, you catch it with one hand. He had big enough hands to catch it with one hand. But uh, this day and age now, it's all technique, and you have to do this, you have to do that. But for me, you have to keep the ball out of the net, and that's what Big Pat Jennings did. He used every part of his body to keep the ball out of the net. It, it sounds like it was a massive learning curve for you. And to talk now about the start of your, your professional career. In July 1995, you began your career at Hull City as a trainee. How did the move to England come about and what was it like to, to migrate countries as a young footballer? Well, it was, uh, it, was strange, uh, it was strange at the start because I think it was in August, uh, I want, let me see, September. I think I went over four weeks trial in September because I was still playing for Balamallet at the time. And uh, I think the season started all already. So it was, uh, I think it was the, probably end of September. When I went over for a week's trial and uh, I broke my finger in the first training session. So I thought that was my chance finished. And uh, about a month later, uh, end of October, I got a phone call and they asked me to come over. And that's how it all, uh, that's all, uh, that's when it all started was the end of October. So I moved over to Hull City in the end of October 95. And uh, I just signed a two year contract as a YTS. And uh, never looked back since. But it was difficult. It was very difficult because I live in a little village outside Alaskillen. And uh, it was very hard for me. And I think the first two months was very difficult. And uh, I basically was, I, I was really homesick. And uh, my family, my family and my friends uh, said, Roy, stick it out and do your best and get out and do things outside football as well. Because we sit in the apartment after after playing after training you need to train two hours a day and you go home and you don't have nothing to do you just think bad things so uh, uh, I started going out with teammates and start doing things out around the town and uh, uh, start going out and uh, do a bit of shopping and playing golf and that's what you need to do keep yourself active and uh, uh, after them two months I was I was in the first team squad then after them first two or three months so it was brilliant it, it went really quick very, very difficult to explain how quick it went, but it went so quick. I was in the first team squad when I was just for 17 years old, which was brilliant for me. That's really impressive. And you mentioned that uh, he was quite homesick at the time. Are you, are you quite a big family person? I was, but uh, what was it's, it's a story like uh, we've got a small, we've got a big family and uh, we lived in a small village. But uh, every summer I used to come home. My first summer I was home for the first, I think it was the, the full holidays we had so I think it was a month and a half maybe two months off and then the second year it was a month and a half and then the next year it was like going down and down and down so it's just the way life is you you end up meeting new friends you're meeting I met my wife and Hull and you, you have you make your own life then and and that's what uh, that's what I'm trying to say to young players over here we have many many players go to England but they come back after two years because the home's sick and for me, uh, I just stuck it out. And uh, every year it was getting less and less. I was coming home. I, th- I don't think I was home for the last 10 years on my summer holidays because uh, I-, I had my own lifetime with my family. 
Yeah, I think I'm well in the belief that a fam- home is where the, the, the person you like spending time with is. And obviously, Ireland played a big part in your upbringing at Northern Ireland. And obviously, you did manage to combat that homesickness as you're growing older. And to link back to your time at Hull City, you went on to make 50 appearances for the club in all competitions across them in two years. How do you look back at your time with the Tigers? The Tiger, uh, Hull City at the time, like, uh, I, it's your first club, and uh, you'll never forget your first club as a professional footballer, especially when I signed my contract as a professional footballer. It was the, the proudest moment of my life, and my, my whole life, and, and it was uh, it was grateful uh, the manager, um, Terry Dolan, gave me the contract. But uh, playing at Hull City, we, uh, it was difficult because we, get, we got relegated my first year there. We got relegated, and... Uh, the second year was uh, the club was in big, big trouble, money, finance, and it was difficult. And the opportunity for me to play somewhere else because the club bought everybody up for sale. So it was unknown what future you led at Hull City at the time. It was difficult at the time, but uh, the club went on and done well for themselves because uh, they got new owners and new owners put a lot of money into it. But I loved every minute of it. I loved it. Uh, Great teammates. Uh, uh, you had uh, Dean Winders, a big name, who used to play play for Hull City. Uh, got them promoted to the Premier League with that goal at, at Wembley. Great player. I learned a lot from him as well. So every every club I've been at, I've learned from. But you always have a, a little soft part, uh, especially for you for the club at Hull City, your first club as a professional player. And uh, I still keep an eye out in the, the results. And and uh, my good mate, Grant McCann, he's the manager there now. So it's great to see, hopefully, he can get the team promoted back up to the championship. Was Dean Windass quite a big character in the dressing room? Because obviously Wigan fans know him quite well because his son, Josh Windass, recently played for the club before moving to Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, see, it, for me, uh, he was a, you could see he was going to go and play in, higher, uh, in a higher league. And he did move on for a while and he came back to Hull City. But uh, he, he was a, a massive player. He, ha- he had the confidence in himself as well. He, he knows he could do better as well. And, and I think you need to have a bit of that uh, as a player. And Dean Wonders, he did have that. Uh, I played against his son a few times, but I think his dad was a lot better. Don't be saying that, but I think his dad was a lot better because <laughs> he, the technique, he was in shooting sessions and in the training ground, it was, uh, it was amazing. Obviously, Dean Wendas was quite a big character. Like, like I said, he, he was quite quite crackers, uh, as described by some of his former teammates. Have you got any, any funny stories of Dean Wendas? No, I was a long time ago. I can't remember that much. Hey, so uh, I, I I'll leave the stories for some other time. But all I can remember uh, Dean uh, uh, Dean Wendas back in them days, he was just a character. And uh, uh, even when we went out as a young a, a young team, like the uh, the YTS used to go out. Dean Wendas used to be around the corner, like, and he had. Uh, come around and give the boys a few quid and say lads and have a good night and enjoy yourselves and relax and see us in training on Monday morning he's a great 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 guy and fantastic uh, role model uh, and I, I really enjoyed playing with Dean it wasn't that long I was playing with him because I was in, I think I was only playing for whole city for a year and a half and I, then I moved on then after a spell of really impressive performances you, you did catch you have several football league clubs and you had a very memorable performance against Wigan Athletic at Springfield Park, which probably ultimately led to the Latic sign you for a club record fee at the time of 350000 Uh Was it a, initially a difficult decision to leave Hull? I know you mentioned earlier that they had a lot of uh, mounting debts and they did need to offload players and everyone's up for sale. I think uh, I think it was one of those situations like with, uh, if, if a club comes in uh, with that much money in them days, it's going to save the club. So uh, for me personally, I was... I was moving to a team who's got, who, who was getting promoted anyhow because it was it was a strange situation because it was still at the end of the season and I moved at the end of the season before the season was over and uh, Wigan was still in league uh, in the in the lower league at that time but they got promoted and uh, I was moving to a team who was getting promoted to a higher league so for me personally it was going to be better for me to play in a higher a higher league but. Uh, you don't know if you're going to be playing or not until you, you turn up and have pre-season and everything goes well. But uh, for me, I'm glad things went well for Hull City after that because I think they just went uphill after that. And uh, and, and I don't want to say anything. Uh, for me personally, I hopefully I could put something back to Hull City then for uh, say, uh, making that money for 350000 which was a lot of money, as I said before, and survived the club because they were in a lot of trouble at Hull City at the time. And... Um, 
or we even got locked out of the uh, training ground a few times. So that's how difficult it was. It was probably a similar situation as as to what we've seen at Wig Athletic now uh, with the financial troubles. And when you joined Wig Athletic uh, back in 1997, uh, was there other teams interested in signing you? And if so, what swayed you towards joining Wig Athletic? Yeah, it was a few years ago, wasn't it? 97, that was quite a few years ago, but uh, there was a few other teams interesting, but uh, I, you know what rumours are like, uh, people saying this, people saying that, and the press are saying things, but uh, Wigan was the only team who came in with the, the, the firm offer, and um, uh, it was uh, I went to Springfield Park and I really, really enjoyed moving there, and met a lot of good people there again as well, everywhere I go. Uh, <laughs> but it was a good step for me. Uh, I played. I was at Wigan for four years, which I enjoyed. It was uh, good people and the supporters were really good. And I, I, I love Springfield Park. It was really small ground, and the fans were the fans were there, and the noise they were making was brilliant. And I really enjoyed it. And we were unlucky a few times that we we didn't get promoted uh, a few times that uh, in my career at, at Wigan. Did you prefer playing at Springfield Park or the DW Stadium? It's it's uh, this it's same now. Uh, you see all these beautiful stadiums and stuff like that there. The, the the new stadium was fantastic at Wigan, but I think the the noise and the fans uh, at Springfield was a little bit better. Uh, it was fantastic, uh, especially when we were playing Man City. <coughs> we were playing Man City in the playoffs, and I think that was our last year playing at Springfield. And yeah, uh, it was. Uh, I think it was, wasn't it? And. Uh, it was the the fans the fans made some noise that day and uh, we came away for one one draw but we lost the game and uh, we lost the second leg uh, at Main Road and that's another thing a lot of people talking about Man City when they moved from their ground to the new ground the the the, 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 the noise is not the same as it used to be at the old ground um, I've been played a few big teams like West Ham as well they've moved to to uh, to another uh, to the a big big stadium and. It's not like Upton Park. It's Upton Park's. Uh, you have uh, hair standing in the back of your neck when you're walking out there because the fans are so close to you. Yeah, it's a really great point you raised. And obviously, when you joined Wing Athletic, a big person involved in the club, and he was involved for many years, was uh, was Dave Whelan. And his vision mm -hmm. uh, for the club moving forward attracted you to, to join his long term project. Yeah, see, uh, Dave Whelan, uh, he bought a lot into that club. Uh, it was amazing what he did for that club and he wanted the, the, the club to be in the top league and uh, the, his ambition was what drive me as well, his ambition, that's what life's all about, you you want to uh, succeed you want to go as high as you can and, and Dave Whelan was one of that type of guy and another thing with Dave Whelan he he he, he looked after the, the club he uh, he had the fans and he loved the fans and he loved the players when any players came in you always talked to him and uh, that's what you need as an owner. You have to have your heart with the club. And I think Dave, Dave Whelan had his heart uh, with not just the, the players, it was the supporters and everybody at the club. How involved was Dave Whelan in the early days of Latics ascendancy to the top flight? Was he quite supportive of other players? I know you mentioned just then that he, he was very supportive. And, and that's obviously great for players as well to have the backing of the chairman, not just your managers and their fellow players. Yeah, I think I think he at the start he was buying he was bringing a lot of players on uh, players in like on big money. Uh, I don't think I think he bought a lot of players in for big money and wages. And uh, I think he realised uh, when I was there for four years, we never got we didn't get promoted. We were close, but we wasn't quite there. And then, then I think he uh, locked locked sat down and locked what he had to do. And I think he changed a lot behind the scenes as well, uh, not just the. Uh, uh, the, the facilities. I think he had to get uh, <coughs> proper coaches, uh, backroom staff, and the training ground up to standards. And uh, I think uh, the rehab as well from injured players, get them back fully fit. And I think that's what uh, the football has turned out to be. And Dave Whelan realizes that. And uh, and um, things changed. Paul Paul Jules came in, and uh, I went to, I went there a different way. And Paul Jules came in, and he he had six years there. I think it was six years, seven years. And he ended up in the Premier League, which was fantastic for the for the for the town and fantastic for the the football fans of Wigan Athletic. As a player back then, did you ever think it was an achievable target for Wigan Athletic to reach the Premier League? No, why not? Uh, that's your ambition. Yeah, you you have ambition. I'm from Northern Ireland. My ambition was to be, become a professional footballer, and uh, a lot of people laughed at me when I said that. 
and uh, uh, and Dave Whelan, I remember people were saying, oh, you're never going to get Wigan in the top flight. But Dave Whelan, he, he, he done it. He showed it to people. He showed uh, he showed the people that it can be done if you looked after the club in the right way. And he did that. And uh, uh, it's just unfortunate now what things are happening now at Wigan. It's just one of those things like uh, football's, it takes ups and downs in, 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 in football. And no matter what club you're at, it, it, football goes up and down like a yo-yo. Absolutely, and, and we're hoping that Wigan can be back in stable hands in the very near future. And to link back to your time at Wigan, you joined as a club record signing, as we touched upon. With that price tag, which was a lot of money at the time, did you ever feel any added pressure to perform? No, I didn't even really thought about it. You know what I mean? It just, uh, for me personally, was uh, I was just a bit annoyed. I, when I first came, I, wasn't, I don't think I played until two months into the season, Lee Butler was the keeper, who was a really good goalkeeper. Lee Butler, I don't think, yeah, if you remember him, Jay, he's a really good keeper. And uh, I couldn't get in the team. John Dean uh, was playing Lee Butler, so I had to bide my time. I, I was still a young, young goalkeeper learning my trade, and uh, it was uh, I wasn't worried about the price tag because I was just worried about getting. I wanted to play football, and I wanted to get as number one spot. Yeah, it was a, a long time for you. I, I believe. Uh... It was seven months before you made your first appearance at the club. And my, oh, my was that, what, was that how long it was? Seven months, yeah. Um, it was seven months before you made your first appearance at Lathix. And How do you feel about that at the time? Well, it's, it's, at the end of the day, uh, it's the manager who picks the team. Like, uh, Of course, you're not happy, but you have to be a team player. And that's what I was. Uh, you had to be a team player. And I, I wanted uh, Wigan to succeed. And uh, at the time, it was, it was frustration not playing football. But... Uh, when you have a goalkeeper like Lee Butler playing there, uh, it's very hard uh, to drop Lee Butler because uh, he, he he got the he started the season because uh, he got the, the team up promoted the year before and he done really well for the club and um, me and him got on really well as well. So that's what goalkeepers are all about. We we only have one position uh, to play and uh, we're still good friends and that's what football's all about and. Uh, you have to fight for that number one spot, and me and him was fighting for that number one spot. It's uh, the, the link back to the uh, the goal, goalkeepers' union, which is often talked about in football. And, and in your four years at Wigan Athletic, you played under a lot of different managers uh, as the club was experiencing quite a bit of a transition. We had uh, John Dean, Ray Matthias, Bruce Riock, uh, John Benson, and, and Steve Bruce, uh, all spending time in the Athletic's dugout uh, when you was in between the sticks. And what was it like to work under each manager? Yeah, we had uh, Colin Greenall as well. He, yeah, uh, yeah, I believe so. He, he came in. He came in for I think he was in for two months as a manager. Uh, but <coughs> it was the, it was strange because I was there for four years. We had uh, all together. We had I had six six managers, and it was a strange. It was strange that because never had that before when I was playing at Hull City. I was only there for a year and a half, and you only had one manager. But uh, it was strange, and um, and the thing is, like uh, playing at Wigan, you had so many different uh, managers. You don't know what manager, who, who, if he fancied you as a goalkeeper or not. But uh, uh, the thing was, I was lucky enough. I played most of my career, football in my career. Uh, I played, I think, I can't remember. I think 150 or something games for Wigan. So uh, the managers must have seen something in me and he kept me in, in in the team. Like so, it was good, good that way. But uh, it's it's difficult sometimes when you have so many different different managers in uh, in a short period of time. And players start getting itchy feet and don't know what's going to happen at the end of the season. And I think that unsettles uh, settles the team a little bit. On that list of managers, who would you say had the biggest influence in your career? And what was the differences between each manager? Because there was a lot of great managers in that list. Uh, they were all like, come here, uh, John Dean, like he was, a, he was a big, big manager. He was a big manager, John Dean, like uh, when I first came in. Uh, but I, I'm. Um, John Benson, John Benson. I think that was a year when we just missed out in the playoff finals, wasn't it? Uh, against Gillingham, uh, we got so close to it and we just missed out in the playoff finals. Uh, I quite liked him, uh, John Benson, because he spoke to me as a uh, as a young keeper. <coughs> you need to have a bit of belief from uh, uh, your, your manager, and the, John Benson believed in me. And uh, it was nice to hear him a few times, not all the time. Trust me, not all the time, but. Uh, once in a blue moon, uh, he might say a few good things and gives you gives you a little boost, and and that's it's nice. It's nice to hear that from the manager. Uh, Steve Bruce came in, and I think he was only there for two months uh, or a month. Uh, he wasn't there that long, uh, but Steve Bruce, as you know, he's 
he's a big name manager in, in in football, and he's been around. He's been around a lot of clubs. So even him, for that short pe- period of time, you learn from everybody. You learn. Uh, I've learned from every manager and uh, every coach. Absolutely. You, you know, obviously, a lot of managers have different ideas, different philosophies, and it's always great to, to learn off each individual manager. And you alluded to it earlier, the, the playoff defeat, where you never quite won a promotion during a time at Latics. I know the one playoff game that stands out uh, to a lot of fans the most when Roy Carroll is mentioned is the playoff semi-final against Reading uh, in, in the... Second leg, uh, the aggregate score was 1-1 as the game entered its final minute. Reading was awarded a late penalty in which he denied Jamie Curtin, but Nicky Foster was there to score from the rebound to send uh, Reading through. How do you remember that moment? I, I imagine you probably try to forget it because it, it's such late heartbreak in a really high stakes game. No, you don't, you don't forget things like that because uh, you learn from them as well. Uh, you learn from bad things, you learn from good things, and that was one of the bad things. <coughs> uh, and a good day that Meta went around the post, or post uh, Meta held on to it, or pu- pushed it away from uh, from the players, but it went straight to uh, one of their players and put it in the back of the net. Which is every every defeat's bad, no matter what. But when you're in the playoffs and you're trying to get promoted, that was uh, it was really dark day like. But uh, um, football. Football, you have to pull your socks back up and go again because football comes around very quick, uh, especially this day and age. Uh, for me, it was it was a hard one to take, uh, especially saving it as well. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it was um, it, it, you have to move on and uh, and learn from them uh, them them uh, games. Even when you win a book, even when you win a game, like when you have a good performance and you win, I watch everything what we're doing and I try and pick out things what I can do better on. That's what uh, that's what I've learned as uh, growing up because when I was at Hull City and sometimes at Wigan, I never had a goalkeeping coach, so I had to learn myself sometimes, you know what I mean? So I used to watch uh, um, Alan Fettis at Hull City, then I was watching Lee Butler when he was playing uh, because I, wanted, I, I had to learn myself sometimes and, and I think that's what stuck in my head and still telling young keepers uh, over here you need to work and learn by yourself as well sometimes that's a, a great great story and a great bit of advice for a young young footballer and i noticed that you mentioned uh lee butler who was obviously ahead of you for a brief time during his time at wigan and obviously it was a massive shame that you never got to win a promotion with your athletic but was you surprised that that squad never did get promoted i was shocked i was shocked like we just missed out uh, a few times, I think I can't remember what year it was, but I remember when we played. I think it was ridiculous. Fifth, what was it? Twelve, fifteen games in a month. It was ridiculous how many games we had to play because we end up going to Wembley and uh, playing in a tournament in Wembley, and then uh, we we missed out in the playoffs because we got we lost in the playoffs. I think it was against Man City. That's what it was. Man City year. Um, that was uh, that was very tough, but. Uh, as I said before, uh, you always have to you always have to forget about what happened the season before um, the season before and just move on and look for the future. And that's what we try to do at Wigan. And uh, it just didn't happen in my four years at, uh, at the club. And I, I would have loved to go uh, the club promoted because uh, I had a lot. The supporters were fantastic to me, and the, the, the players, and and not just the players, the people in the background, like even the the dinner lady at the at the, um, at Springfield at the the training ground, uh, they're all fantastic people. Who was the, the standout players in the Latic squad at the time? And was there any players in that team who you felt deserved to play at, at a high level, but for whatever, whatever reason it didn't happen? Yeah, there was, uh, as, as, as you know, big Pat, Pat came down from Manchester United and uh, <coughs> a good big centre-half like, and he's from my part of the world as well, Northern Ireland, but uh, he had big Simon Hor- a big Simon up front, a big striker, Neil Roberts, uh, uh, you see Paul Warren now, he's the manager at Rotherham. All good players, like we had a lot of good players coming through the books, like, but I can't name them all, but they were, they were fantastic players. And <coughs> as I said before, I, I learned from each one of them as well. Stuart Barmer playing at the back, uh, he played, in the, uh, played for Charlton as well. Uh, and uh, um, really, really great, great players around. And uh, as I said before, good good coaches and good managers as well that came in and out. What was the most memorable match you ever played for your athletic? Uh, yeah, the one that, I know this doesn't 
count like, but uh, I'm going for the Manchester United one when we opened the stadium. I loved that game. It was, uh, I think I played the first 45 minutes um, and uh, I was playing against Dwight York and all the top players, Manchester United, and I just, I was buzzing. Uh, I was a young lad and I was buzzing and uh, made a few saves, made a few catches and enjoyed it like, but uh, I think, I think, the, I think just, I uh, think just, that's the one that's a friendly friendly game like does that count no does that count you can have it you can have it and a question I was actually going to ask was about that friendly it was obviously a close first ever out against the, at the DW Stadium uh, you had a very impressive game and do you think that match eventually helped you to get signed by Manchester United I, uh, I was going to tell you a story later on like, but you brought it up now uh, that's what uh, after that game uh, Sir Alex um, <coughs> when I moved to Manchester United Sir Alex uh, met up with me and we had a meet we had a talk and he says we've been watching you since that game and that was like two years uh, that was two years uh, he was been watching me from that game uh, that's what uh, he got his scouts to come and watch me ever since that game so that's what uh, Ferguson said uh, so Alex said to me when we had a meeting uh, so you had a manager who's a world-class manager you had his scouts watch me for over two years which was uh, a bit scary though thinking about it Absolutely. And, and Sir Alex Ferguson is undoubtedly, in my opinion, the most decorated manager that's ever managed a Premier League club, um, especially in my era. I'm uh, I'm 21, so I have not really seen as many managers as, as probably as yourself. But Sir Alex always has had the reputation. I remember growing up, Manchester United was a force to be reckoned with. You look at that picture list in the Premier League and that's a game you'd kind of always wanted to skip past. It used to be a 5 4 nil defeat every time and uh, to link back uh, to the time at Wigan, uh, you obviously earned a really good reputation as a really promising uh, young goalkeeper in England. Um, how did you feel your progression was at Wigan? Did you learn quite a lot from, from the managers you worked with? And, and did you feel like you, you matured as well as you got older and gained more experience uh, playing first-team football? Yeah, I, 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 did, I did learn a lot. Like, uh, like, if we go back a bit, Jay, when I said about uh, goalkeeping coaching... <laughs> That was the biggest disappointment at Wigan. We didn't have a, a really first-team goalkeeping coach. And uh, I think that was my uh, biggest aim, was trying to get full-time coaching. And uh, it was uh, that's, that, that, that was the thing when I went to Man U. I knew I wasn't going to play much football, but I was looking to, uh, to learn even more as a, with a goalkeeping coach. And uh, <coughs> that was the that was the only downfall at Wigan, and that's what I was saying before about uh, Dave Whelan stepped back and started uh, looking behind the scenes, and I think he started bringing people in and looking after that, uh, looking after those um, type of situations like goalkeeping coaches you need to have at the club because you have so many keepers at the club which needs to be coached, and uh, I think that Dave Whelan did that after that, and uh, but for me. Uh, that the move to going to Man U was down to Wigan because uh, I, I was playing probably my best football at Wigan at the time. Uh, I think I know we never made the, the promotion. Uh, we we sh we were so close to it a few times and a few times in my four years. But uh, uh, when you get a club like Manchester United looking at you and uh, been watching you for two years, it was uh, it was you couldn't say no really. Was it a really special moment for you to be to be wanted by one of the biggest clubs in the world? It must be a dream come true for for a young lad uh, from Northern Ireland. It it was uh, it was a strange one because I was supposed to be in there. There was a lot of talk of me going to a Premier League team at the end of that season, my last season at uh, Wigan. But um, Paul Jules came in as well at the end of that season, and uh, it was. Um, I think Wigan pre-season then came. I turned up for pre-season. I think uh, Wigan went up to Scotland for pre-season. I, I was told I had to stay behind. And I got a, a phone call from the agent saying, uh, you're going to go to Le Leicester, uh, have a, speak to Leicester. Uh, Peter Taylor was the manager at the time. They just got promoted to the Premier League and they wanted, to, wanted me to come down and speak to them and wanted to sign me. And uh, we shook hands on it, went down, spoke to Leicester, shook hands on it. And... Uh, uh, things happened for a reason. For some reason, uh, the deal fell through because I, uh, Peter Taylor said that he was looking for a more experienced goalkeeper. And that was disappointing. But uh, you look back now and say, things happened for a reason. And my, my agent rang me and he turned around and said, Roy, so Alex wants to speak to you. 
So I said that I, I, I didn't believe him. Like I just put the phone down because I was still a little bit disappointed not going to Leicester because they just got promoted to the Premier League. You want to end up playing the big, biggest league in, uh, in, in England. And uh, that opportunity fell through at the time. But then he rang me back and said, no, he wants to speak to you tomorrow. So it just happened so quickly. He went down to Old Trafford and spoke to Sir Alex then and spoke for a good two hours talking about football and family life, which was, which was unbelievable as well. But uh, uh, it was it was strange uh, looking back how quick it happened uh, from coming in to start a new season uh, when Wigan went up to Scotland for pre season and I was gone. I think it was gone in the next two days. What do you remember from that to our conversation with Sir Alex Ferguson? I think uh, I remember it was more about your family, how my family and uh, my wife and how's the how's your family life going? You know what I mean? I think he was more into person personally getting know, to, to know you as a person off the pitch because I think he knew everything about me on the pitch because he watched me for two years so I think he knew uh, and I knew I was going to United expecting to be the number two anyhow because uh, you had Fabian Bortez who won everything in, in uh, international football he's uh, one of the great keepers in, uh, in France who, who won many trophies for France and uh, but as I said before, I wanted to go and learn more and I, I wanted to learn from the best. And if you can't learn from the best, like the players like Roy Keane, Keith, um, Giggsy and uh, all them players, David Beckham, uh, there's something not right with you. So I learned a lot when I moved to Man U as well. So every every club, slowly but surely, every club I went to, I've learned and got bigger and bigger and learned, learned different things from different players and different coaches. What did you make of the jump from Wigan Athletic to Manchester United? Big big step. The the training, the training was so so quicker, uh, intense. It was intense. It was unbelievable. I think my first year at Manchester United uh, at the end of the season, I think I must have slept for nearly two weeks. <coughs> mentally, it was mentally drained. Uh, drained. Uh, didn't play many games in my first season, but my first game was, I think my first game for Manchester United was the I think it was the fourth game in the season. So you have to prepare any time. You have to prepare any time to play. And that was a big problem as well, being a number two. You don't know when you're going to play and you have to be mentally prepared. And I think I wasn't ready for that. But the next season, I was prepared for everything. And I learned from I learned from the season before. Uh, I know people might laugh at me, but it was nearly two weeks when I slept for because it was so, so, so draining on, on, on my brain. I was just about to say, uh, what was his training regimes like? Because Sir Alex Ferguson demanded a lot from his players. Yeah, the training. Uh, first of all, like the, even even the warm up was intense. Like we played like uh, like boxes, and you had two players in the middle of the box, and you try and keep the ball away from the players in the middle of the box, and it was very intense. And players diving in, try and win the ball. Uh, training sessions, like uh, I think uh, the first year I was there, we we might not even have a, a day off in two months because we played. Uh, we played Saturday or Sunday, or we played Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, two, two games a week. And I think it was, I think for two months, we never had a day off. And it was just pure intensity training. Okay. When the players who did play, they, they probably had two days rest because they have to recover from the game. But they still come in, they still come in the training ground and do a warm down and then, uh, sorry, do a cool down and uh, go in the treatment room, get a uh, massage and wherever they get. And uh, the players who didn't play would have to do extra training. And uh, but I enjoyed it. Uh, you're looking around and you're playing for the best players in the world. And as a young, I think it was twenty, I think it was twenty three when I moved to uh, to Manu, which was uh, still a young for a young keeper. And uh, uh, just fantastic when you have people like David Beckham taking free kicks against you. I was just about to say, what was it like to train with some of those big hitters, Paul Scholes, David Beckham, Ryan Giggs? So many fantastic players, uh, and you was there having them uh, whack balls at you uh, in between the sticks. Yeah, I think uh, I think I thought when David Beckham left, it would have been all right, but then Ronaldo came in. It was even worse. It was even worse. It was difficult. <laughs> but uh, I tell you the truth, uh, the manu every single manu player at the club were, were brilliant. Like with me when I first joined, and and I think that's that's the thing with Manchester back in the day. So Alex wanted to bring the right people in. Who who would work as a team, and uh, and I think that's what that went down the whole way down to the boot room up to the first team players. What was it like to, to work with Cristiano Ronaldo so early in his career? Obviously, such a decorated yeah. player now. 
one of the best uh, oh, he's, of the generation. Kimi, uh, I I always say to young kids, who's your favourite player? And people say Messi, young kids say Messi, other players say Ronaldo. And I said, I I, I played with Ronaldo when I was uh, at Manchester United. And he was, an, he, he was a young lad. We came back from America pre-season and stopped off in, uh, stopped, stopped off in Portugal to play a sport in Lisbon. <clears throat> and Ronaldo, he was just, I think he was just 17, 17 years old, 18 years old. And the skill he had then was amazing. But uh, he wasn't as strong as he is now. And uh, that's the thing I'm trying to say to people is like, it's not just, it doesn't just come to you. You have to work on it. And he, he was in the gym a long, long time, like at United, to build himself up because he knew the English football was very, very tough. Did you know with his mentality that he was going to be a success and have the career he was going to have? I, I, did, uh, I did think he was going to go as far, for a long, long way because his dedication was there. His lifestyle was all about football. Uh, he wasn't one of these players like uh, go out, do this, do that. But his lifestyle was just committed to football, and uh, he was dedicated to it. And you could see it. Like he, he turned up, uh, he turned up to Manchester, couldn't speak a word of English, and then after two months, he was speaking English. And that's dedication. That is dedication. And uh, Ronaldo, uh, that's where he is, where he is, and he's still playing at a high level. And I think he scored two goals there last night for Juventus. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced he's, uh, he's not a human, to be honest. He's, he's such an unbelievable athlete as well as a footballer. And growing up, he mm. was a player when, when United used to come to uh, the DU Stadium or the JJB Stadium back then. You just watch players like Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, Thierry Henry, uh, who was at Arsenal at the time, and you get blown away by the ability he had. Ryan Giggs as well was one for me. I never really got to see him in his prime. Uh, I saw him as he was getting yeah. older, but he's always been a quality player. And do you have any memorable stories of uh, being at United and uh, in training sessions with some of these uh, massive names in the footballing world? No, all I can remember is uh, you had to win the five sides because if you're in the team with Roy Keane, he's going to have a go at you because he's a winner. He wants to see the win. And that's another thing. Uh, that's what I learned as well playing at Manchester United. Everything you do at Man U, you have to, you have to give everything 100%. You can't just turn up and just say, oh, I'll be all right, I'll take it easy today. No, you can't do that, especially when you have Gary Neville and uh, Roy Keane in your, in your team. And uh, that's the biggest thing I learned at United. Uh, but uh, but uh, I've seen many, many players like coming at Old Trafford, like uh, at, the, at the, the training ground in Carrington, and uh, they're given 100%. They turn up probably 40 minutes, an hour before training, ready to go, getting themselves prepared. And I think that's why I've seen a difference at, at Manchester United, these players are on lot, lots of money, but loads of money. But they they end up staying, they end up staying doing extra bits of work after training. Uh, like I said before, you had David Beckham taking free kicks, you had Gary Neville running down the wing and whipping balls in, and uh, that's dedication as footballers, and uh, that's what young players need to see. They only see it on TV. They think, oh, they're just I want to be like him, I want to be like that. But you have to be dedicated to be to be a professional footballer. Absolutely, I, I fully agree. And, and during your time at Manchester United, you won the Premier League in the 2002-2003 season and the FA Cup in 2004. What was those, those experiences like for you to, to win silverware? I mean, winning the Premier League was, jeez, I couldn't believe it. It's, uh, if, I, if I went back to when I was 15 years old, uh, looking to be a professional footballer, and then about 10, 10, 10 years later, or whatever it is, uh, I've got a, a Premier League medal uh, uh, in my house. I would never, I would have said, don't be silly, but, uh, you know what I mean? But it happened, it happened for me and it's a it's great experience. And uh, it's the one I would never forget the rest of my life, uh, especially celebrating at Everton when we won it. I think, I remember, I think Leeds beat uh, Arsenal in the second last game of the season um, at Highbury. And we thought Arsenal were going to win that. And we had to go to Everton to, to, get, to get a point or win or, or don't lose at least, uh, but lucky enough, Leeds be done us a big favour, and Leeds and Manchester United hate each other. But Leeds done Manchester United a big favour that day by beating Arsenal. So we had uh, we had the whole week going up to Everton, and we were celebrating uh, winning the league. But we even turned up and beat Everton that day, the last game of the season. Uh, and that's that's the that's the the mindset of players at United and the coaching staff, even when we won the league. Everton had to win. Everton had to get a point to make Europe. I think that year, and we end up winning the game two one. So 
no matter what we had, in, uh, we won the league the week before, but we still wanted to win that game as well. Absolutely, and that's the, the winning mentality installed by Sir Alex Ferguson. How did uh, Sir Alex Ferguson man manage all these players and how did he install that kind of elite mentality into his side? The, be- the, thing, the thing with Sir Alex, what I learned from Sir Alex was like he was the manager, he wasn't the coach. He wasn't the coach. He was the manager. So he never took the training sessions, but he would have been there watching. And he would have been walking around, talking to the players and, and seeing if the players are okay and keep, keep, keep talking to him. And I think that was brilliant, you know what I mean? Because I've been in many teams that uh, you have the manager who takes the coaching as well. And it's the same voice over and over the whole week. But once you have Sir Alex who comes in on a Saturday, everybody keeps quiet and listens because uh, you haven't heard him all week. You just... Uh, you might have spoke to your one-on-one, but uh, I think that was good. That's just my opinion. And I really liked it because you had a coach. Uh, he had an assistant man, uh, assistant coach who would have talked to tr- training sessions. And then Sir Alex would have been there on the match day, ready to go. And, and uh, it was it was one of those situations when you, if you're not doing well at half time, <coughs> sometimes you walk in and won't even say a word. And you know he's not in a good mood. So you have to go out and win the game, second half. Absolutely. Yeah. And what was, was you ever at the uh, receiving end of the hairdryer treatment or did you ever see it? Because I know that's quite famously associated with Sir Alex Ferguson. No, I, I was never, never, I, I thought I was going to get one after the, uh, the game against Spurs, <coughs> uh, against Spurs at home and when the ball supposed to went over the line, but uh, it never went over the line. So I thought he was, was going to say something to me then in the hairdryer treatment, but he never. So uh, I never had it one and Lucky enough, uh, for the four years I was there, I was, uh, it, it, I was, I was okay. I was in the good books, so it wasn't too bad. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned uh, that that Tottenham moment because although you made over 70 appearances for Manchester United, it's probably fair to say that you was probably most remembered for the ghost goal against Tottenham Hotspur, uh, mm-hmm. where Pedro Mendes, the speculative one range effort, seemingly caught you out. Was you amazed as everyone else uh, that the goal wasn't given? I don't, I, don't, I, tell you, I talk about it a lot. Like a lot of people that brings this question up to me, but I brought it up today because I think I knew Jay, you would have brought it up anyhow in the, in the long term. <laughs> but uh, Kimia, I just, I, of course, I knew it was over. Uh, but I'm scooping it from over the line. Like, but the, the thing is, like, you, as I said back back before, like, uh, you want to win the game, and Spurs Spurs had that. Uh, it was a freak accident, uh, but. Had to react and reacted, and uh, the referee and the linesman never seen it, so uh, it was no no. Did Sir Alex Ferguson praise you for your reactions uh, in that moment? I think uh, I think he that what he said was the reactions were very good. You know what I mean? Because some people would just give up and uh, and just stand there, but uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, like I'm doing now over here is coaching young goalkeepers, and I said to him, never give up uh, because you never know what might happen in the game. Um, especially that that one against Spurs, uh, it came off my chest and my hands and went over my shoulder. Could have stood there, and hands and my hips, but carried on and scooped it back before I went over the line. Uh, absolutely, and that's <laughs> a great that's a that's a great lesson to teach to, to younger students who are who are obviously learning learning the, the the ropes in football. And, and as a goalkeeper, this is something that's always intrigued me. Is do you find that? Mistakes are often penalised and highlighted a lot, a lot more than any other position because obviously if a striker misses an open goal, I don't think they'll get a, a, the same amount of flack if a goalkeeper makes a mistake. I, I just think that's where things... I watch a lot of football now and it's just, it, it, it does a bit upset me now a little bit when you have so many people on TV talking about goalkeeping errors uh, who's never been a goalkeeper. So they don't know what... Uh, I don't know sometimes what they're saying and stuff like that there and you're thinking Can you, uh, it's a difficult ball to, to save or, or whatever but I do understand it's their job to do this as TV pundits but for me uh, that's the problem with goalkeeping now I don't really see a goalkeeper that who might come out and command a six yard box or his 18 yard box uh, back in the day you used to come out and catch the ball and be strong and commit yourself to, uh, nowadays there's so many t- different pundits having goal keepers I think keepers are frightened to do things now to come out and make, make uh, come out for a cross or whatever, but that's the truth. That's just me. Uh, when you're watching the game, you're thinking a six foot four goalkeeper. If he jumps, he's going to be completely taller than everybody else, and you're catching the ball with your hands. Uh, but I think it's just because uh, it's the way football is now. I think this uh, 
I might have been told to just stay in your box and let the defenders deal with it. Because I remember when I was playing at Wigan, uh, John Benson said to me, Roy, you come for every ball because you're catching everything and, 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 and takes a lot of pressure off the defence. And that was my strong point playing at Wigan, was coming for crosses and catching catching the ball and uh, taking pressure off my defence. And, and that's I, that's why I love to try and get goalkeepers to back, like especially in Northern Ireland, was is come out and catch that ball and command that 18-yard box. Absolutely. It's, it's the way how football's evolved. Because I think goalkeepers nowadays are expected to be more football, if that makes sense. Uh, they're meant to be... I, uh, you're, with it. you're right. You're, you're right, Jay. You're right. And it's all about... That's what's... That it's all about uh, great feet work and stuff like that there and getting the ball out from the back and do this and do that. But then you forget you have to make saves as well and you have to come out and stop the stop the cross coming in, uh, catching the cross and uh, all this technique. Now you punch everything, which is uh, okay. You probably have to punch it once in a while, but uh, a lot of punching as a goalkeeper now, and that's the biggest uh, disappointment. Uh, if you can catch a ball in training, why can you not catch it in a game? That's a very fair point. And to link back to your time at Manchester United, uh, have you got any untold funny stories uh, about your time at Old Trafford? I remember uh, one time we went to America and uh, woke up the next day and someone, uh, I can't remember who it was, but uh, I'm not going to say names, he knows who it is anyhow, but uh, shaved my eyebrow and I didn't even know until I walked downstairs. So that was... Uh, it wasn't funny for me, but it was funny for everybody else because when I was walking down the steps, everybody was laughing and I just didn't realise what they were laughing at and uh, my eyebrow was shaved off. So it was, uh, as a football, you, you, you go through your career and you get a few little things done to you, but uh, I won't like to say any more like, but that was the, probably the worst because I was walking around for about five minutes downstairs, people laughing at me and I didn't know what was wrong with me. What was it like, <laughs> what was it like? What was it like when you were next saw yourself in the mirror? Uh, with only one one eyebrow, I thought it looked cool. No, I'm only joking. I thought, oh my god, what am I going to do here? I said, I'm going to shave the other one off or what? Uh, I think uh, we went. I think uh, this was in America. I came back and I think it was about a month later. We had a team photo and it was still it was still bad. So it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant. And I'm going to ask you this question now. You're more welcome to uh, to to not answer it. But is it true, as claimed by Luke Steele on the Under the Cosh podcast? That you had a bit of a coming together with Dev from Coronation Street at Manchester United Christmas party. Yeah, I came here, Luke Steele. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it was that bad. Like, if it was that bad, I don't think he would have been still around. Like, I would have. I think I would have put him down with one punch. But uh, no, I can't remember that. Luke Steele must. Have been, I don't know what he was on about. Luke Steele. I need to have so, a word so of him. You don't really remember Dev from Coronation Street being a uh, being at a Christmas party or, or anything of that nature. He probably was like, but to me, there was uh, quite a few people around like, but uh, Dev like uh, I don't even know who he is. Who is he? <laughs> he's a uh, off Coronation Street. He's uh, I think he's his characters. Uh, I don't watch Coronation Street to be honest. Uh, I think he's a oh, shop no, owner as well. I uh, I don't watch so. Uh, no, I don't, I don't watch. I don't watch. Life, so I, I don't watch Coronation. I don't watch Coronation Street yet, so I can't say. I probably he probably was there then. <laughs> he probably was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Who knows? I, I'm sure. It, it, it was an interesting story. Don't worry, I, I, I don't worry, Jay. I, I ring Luke Steele and see what he's on about to see because he probably know more than me anyhow. <laughs> so uh, to, to link back to, uh, to the playing time, the, the, the events on the pitch. Uh, you, you left Manchester United in May 2005 after your contract expired. You, you turned down a new deal for the search of, of more first-team football and you eventually signed for West Ham United. What was the decision like to leave Manchester United? When did you realise that your time was coming to an end and, and what was the thought process of joining West Ham? Because I know a lot of players in your position would have been quite happy to sign a new deal, earn quite a lot mm. of money and, and just sit on the bench. Yeah, I know what you mean there. Uh, uh, United was uh, it was good uh, for me four years. I had Tony Colton, um, I had a... A, go uh, a goalkeeping coach who was there for four years I thought I've learned a lot from him I learned a lot from Bortez I know he was only there for a year but I learned uh, what a character he was Tim Howard was there as well so I learned from these keepers but for me it was time now for me to move on and play football and I was 27 years old so Alex was great uh, was uh, great as ever as a manager he put, pulled me in uh, in January he said to me Roy we'd like you to stay like but uh it's gonna maybe a bit more or less uh, game time in the next uh, in your next contract, but uh, he shook my hand. He says, "I wish you all the best, Roy," 
and uh after January I thought like any other manager would probably sit me in the stands and, and that was me finished but uh, I played I played um, the rest of the season and I played the last game of the season and that was an FA Cup final when we lost uh, on penalty shootouts against Arsenal and that was difficult uh, losing that in the penalty shootout against Arsenal when we should have won it but this decision what came <coughs> um, I probably came in that January when I spoke to Ferg, Sir Alex and and uh, I just wanted to play more football, more game time. And uh, the opportunity came to me to, uh, to go to West Ham when the summer came. And they were still in the Premier League with West Ham. And, and uh, I ended up going to London. And there was a big, another big step for me going down to London. It was uh, the, the capital of a big, big city, uh, London. I thought, how, how am I going to drive around this part of the world? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I imagine London is a bit, a bit of a nightmare to, to navigate yourself around. And you hit the ground running at Upton Park. You made uh, 19 appearances before you sustained a back injury in a match against Fulham mm. in January 2006, um, which left you requiring surgery. How did this affect you mentally after making such a great start as you were sidelined for the rest of the season and you even missed the FA Cup final against Liverpool? Yeah, it was... Um, it was... It was hard, trust me. It was very, very hard. I talk about it a lot now because back here in Northern Ireland, uh, mental awareness, I try and push as much as I can because there's a lot of it's, it's serious over here for mental health and uh, people talking to people, the, the patient me coming out talking about the mental health. But for me at the time, it was it was difficult because as a young person, as you heard from me in the past there, was I just loved playing football, loved playing sport and uh, and I got that taken away from me with this back injury and uh, I was out for nearly 10 months I think it was nine months 10 months and uh, when you once you go for a back operation you always think in the back of your mind can I get back from this can I get back from this and um, I just I just thought the worst the worst things can happen uh, looking back now I was a bit selfish because there was a lot of the worst people who had to retire from football but uh, at the time I never thought that at the time it was uh, it was a bad injury and uh kept me out for a long time and and uh, the drink took over to tell you the truth Jay. the drink took over the depression depression got worse and I thought the drink will even help me I drank I used to drink uh, all the time like you know what I mean but this was really bad I just drank to forget things and uh, it was hard hard times like and I think I uh, end up leaving West Ham to go to, uh, to go to Glasgow Rangers the team I played for uh, the team I supported as a young lad and uh it's just things took over, and uh, and when the drink takes over, that it's it's hard to get back off it. I was on the drink for nearly three or four years, solid, which was hard to take. Before this happened, what was your relationship previously like with alcohol uh, when you were at previous clubs? Oh, the boy, uh, people, I, the boys, the, my teammates, they know me. I I, I like to drink, uh, have a bit of fun, have a banter. Um, uh, that's what it was like from Northern Ireland. Uh, we all. We all have fun and uh, and I always had drink, but I was enjoying it. I was enjoying it, but this time when I was when I did start getting the depression, I wasn't enjoying the drink. I was drinking the the, the get rid of the depression, which I thought might help, but it didn't help me. It got worse the next day. The depression got worse and worse and worse, and I drank more and more and more, and and that's that was the that was the hardest trying to get back up, get off the drink to sort the depression out and. I still battle. I've been off the drink now for nearly ten years. Coming up and uh, coming up this June, actually, ten years I've been off the drink, and uh, the depression comes back once in a while, especially with this lockdown, COVID nineteen. It's uh, it's it's hard to keep your mind active. Thanks for your honesty. And, and in terms of your relationship with alcohol, did that ever affect your family uh, when you was going through that really rough patch? Oh, yeah, of course it does. Uh, it affected my family. I left. Uh, I left uh, the family home and my, my wife uh, uh, left my wife and the kids and I just didn't care about anybody. I wasn't bothered about anybody. I was just drinking. And uh, that was the, the hardest thing looking back in my life. And I regret every minute of it because my wife's been through a lot. And I think I was out of, out of the game for nearly nine months. I had no club for nine months. And um, I just I woke up one day. I've, I don't know if you've heard this before, but I've, talked about it quite a bit I woke up in an apartment in canary wharf and just looked in the mirror and didn't, didn't even know who it was and it was me looking back at myself and i just from that day i just stopped and just said i have to sort myself out because i'm going to end up I'm going to end up dead because 
I've lost my football, lost my family, and and uh, the drinking wasn't helping me. And I was drinking anything at the time as well, so I think my insides were in a bad way at the time. Was that the the defining moment which made you realise that you need to seek out professional support with dealing with your mental health? That's that's my that was my problem. I did go and see uh, uh, professional help when I was drinking. Uh, about I think it was about uh, when I was at West Ham at the time. Uh, I went into rehab, but my own mind, I didn't think it was bad. That was my problem. I didn't think it was me. Uh, I had a problem. It was my wife and my agent who said, "Roy, you have you have a problem." But my mind was saying to me, "I was okay." So basically, that was at West Ham. I went the Rangers. I went the Rangers for six months. I went to Derby County for a year and a half, and then I was in uh, Denmark for a year and a half. So there's what's that three and a half? You're talking about nearly four years drinking since the rehab, and that incident happened in Canary Wharf when I woke up and didn't realise who I was in the mirror. Something clicked in my head, and I said this many times. Something clicked in my head and said, "I have to grow. I have to get sort myself out." And basically, I just sort my I didn't go for professional help. I was I was quite lucky. I left. Uh, I got a phone call. I went back to my wife and spoke to my wife and said, "Love, I'm going to be off. I'm going off the drink, staying off the drink." And she heard it so many times before, so she didn't believe me. And then uh, I did stay off it. And I got a phone call from a Greek agent, asked me to go out to uh, an island called Crete, uh, the playing top league in in Greece. And me and the wife and the kids went out to Greece for a week for for look around see what it's like and we never came back we just we loved it out there different lifestyle so I was quite fortunate uh, to leave the United Kingdom because I don't know what it'll be what it would have been like if I stayed in the United Kingdom I don't mean that in a bad way by people around me it was just because I might not have been strong enough but when I went to Greece it was a different lifestyle different culture uh, met quite a few players out uh, in football who, who who didn't drink when we went out so it was we were going out drinking orange juice and try and get over it but them six months in Greece for six months was the hottest six months of my life because my body thought I needed alcohol and it was my body was completely ruined at the time and it took me a while to get back back up and running again I was lucky enough uh, them six months I must have been doing something right because I got a phone call from Olympiagos and they wanted to buy me from Hoffe end up going to Olympiagos and have a look back since it's a really great story and, and, and to link back, I, I really applaud you bravely for talking about your mental health and obviously football and mental health are, are two things that not often uh, people talk about and did you feel like the fame of thoughts, you know, of, of being a professional footballer maybe actually a bit of a barrier about that? No, I think I think the main thing as a footballer is like, because if you come out and say you have a problem, would a club buy you would a club keep you on contract you know what i mean if you come out and say you have uh, mental uh, depression you had uh yeah you, yeah you, you're not, i'm an alcoholic i can't touch drink i'm an alcoholic you know what i mean uh, put my hands up i'm an alcoholic but uh, uh if you go to the football manager and say come here i've got a problem i'm an alcoholic i'm uh, i've got depression do you think the manager is going to sign you a new contract yeah i think that's a very fair point because they, they may um, avoid you because of that reason. Mm-hmm. When I feel like the stigma mental health... I'm not, I'm not uh, going around the bus. Hey, Jay, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go around the bus here, but they're not going to sign you. you no, know what I mean? There's no may. There may, there may be a no, yeah. No, they're not going to sign you. You know what I mean? That's it. Yeah. Because, because I came back. I came back from Greece and people... I, Sean Derry rang me up. I had no club. I came back from Greece and I was in the Northern Ireland team. And uh, I was saying, I'll come back to England now and see if I can get a team back in England. And Sean Derry was the only one who rang me and he said, Roy, I spoke to a few people and uh, we heard uh, we would like you to come over to Notch County. And Notch County was in League One at the time and, and I had no other offer on the table. You know what I mean? Once you have that bad name, uh, you can't, you're never going to, no one's going to touch you. You know what I mean? So, and, and, and that's the problem as footballers. For footballers, if you have a problem, you're going to come out and say something because they're too scared to come out because the supporters will say, oh, come here, you're on enough money. What are you doing? You know what I mean? You're all right. Depression. Anybody can get depression. Anybody can get depression. And uh, if the manager and the, 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 the owners of the club finds out that you're an alcoholic and you've got depression, what's the point keeping them, keeping them on the staff? You know what I mean? Uh, it's just the way it is. And I, st- I still think, I, I do understand what the P- I do understand what the PFA is trying to do, but 
no joking behind. Uh, there's no joke behind it. The players are not going to come out and say it. Like probably most of the players who come out and say it is after when they finish playing football. I was about to say back then, was it not public knowledge uh, about your, your struggles with mental health? No one, no one knew until I came out and spoke about when I was in Greece. You see, and uh, spoke spoke freely about it when I was in Greece, and uh, when I came back to Northern Ireland, I spoke about it, and uh, it's just, I think that was the biggest relief was getting it out there, and uh, I think that was the, sk- the hardest thing to get out was uh, to get it out that I was an alcoholic and de- had bad depression, because you're just worried about everybody else. But my day now is, don't worry about anybody else. At the end of the day, you have to look after yourself first, and then you can look after people around you. Because uh, if you don't, if you can't look after yourself, there's how are you going to look after your family around you? So that's that's my advice for people. Please, if you have problems, sort yourself out and try and get help. If you can't get help, there's always someone out there who can help you. So don't be shy. That's a, that's a brilliant message. And what I'm quite intrigued to know is what was the dressing room response uh, to your mission about your mental health? Where what what change room? Sorry. Uh, when when you opened up to some of your teammates about your uh, alcohol alcohol addiction and your mental health, what was the reaction to that? Was the the you'll be all right culture uh, still around, or did the teammates appreciate the problem? I was in Greece. At, I was at Greece at the time. They all uh, they all knew I didn't drink because uh, when I went to Greece, uh, I was off the drink for about a month, two months anyhow. <clears throat> but they all knew I never drank because I was. Then the new, the why you know what I mean. Uh, I came out and done a, an interview in Greece and spoke open open about it, uh, openly about it, and I spoke to MUTV about it as well. So uh, I basically just opened up and got everything out in the open. But in Greece, it was different. There was different um, temperament out there in Greece. It was like uh, it was more different culture. Uh, it wasn't like when you play a game in England, you go out and have a few beers afterwards. In Greece, you go out and you go out and get some food afterwards. That's what it was all. That's what it was like in Greece. <coughs> Absolutely. And do you think early in Korea, there was more of a drill, drinking culture amongst players, especially in the nineties and the two thousands? I think it was. Yeah, uh, I think it was like you play hard and you you have a few drinks after the game. Uh, you go up to the players' bar and you have a few pints with your 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 teammates and you, maybe your mates who you played against and. You have a chat about the game and all that. It's just, it's just the way it was, uh, just the way football was in them days. I think, uh, I think Austin Bangers changed it all when he brought the French players over and things started to slowly change. You've seen Tony Adams, uh, Tony Adams uh, came out and said the same thing uh, when Austin Wenger came in. The, the 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 culture changed at Arsenal. Uh, absolutely, and to, to link back and and I'd like to ask, um, is there anything? You've already touched upon it, um, which is absolutely brilliant. That if you are struggling with your mental health, it's important to be brave and reach out and speak to someone because there will be someone there to help you. And I'd like to now go back onto the, the football side of things. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you you spent some time with Olympiacos, and uh, how do you reflect <coughs> on your time in Greece? Because obviously, before that, you were there with Crete. You earned your move there to Olympiacos. You had quite a memorable debut as well, I believe. Yeah, it was uh, a fantastic memories. That was it was. I can't forget that one, the debut in Moscow. It was like minus 13. It was very, very cold. And uh, I was, uh, I think, the, the the goalkeeper, the number one keeper, he got sent off 15 minutes before the end of the game. And uh, we were winning 1-0 in the Europa League. And basically, it took me seven minutes to get all the, the training gear off me because it was that cold. And uh, end up end up going on and save the penalty. And the, the fans in Olympiagos, the the they love me after that. Like the the fans in Greece are fantastic. Hey, the the love the team, uh, and the supporters are mad. Like uh, in a good way, mad in a good way. I really enjoyed it out there. And my second game was in uh, at the at home in the second leg, and uh, I pulled my hamstring in the last twenty minutes, and I ended up playing on with uh, a pulled hamstring. And the fans appreciate every minute of it. What I've done for the club and the team. Uh, staying on and, uh, with a pulled hamstring. That's uh, really special, and you, you obviously enjoyed your time in Greece. And uh, after you, you mentioned it uh, earlier, that after that you joined Notts County. How do you reflect on your time on uh, on Notts County? Yeah, Notts County. It was uh, Notts County's um, 
the oldest club it was the oldest club in the, in the football league and they've, they've went through the same thing as Wigan's going through uh, they had a guy come in many years many years ago and said he had money and they end up flipping uh, he had no money and the club went downhill big time Sven Gorn Eriksson was the manager um, Smeichel was the goalkeeper young, young Smeichel was the goalkeeper and uh, they've got relegated now they're playing uh, non-league football it's, it's, it's a it's a massive club, Notts County. But when I went, it was uh, it was we were in League One at the time, and Sean Dyer was the manager. And uh, my dad's from Nottingham, by the way, so I have family over there. My dad's a my dad's a Notts County fan, so yes. <laughs> so that would be brilliant uh, for him. Oh, he loved it. He loved it. Uh, uh, I so I had family over there as well. So it was nice. It was I I went over for one year. Uh, because I wanted to play football, I wanted to play on because I wanted to play for the in the Euros uh, with Northern Ireland, and uh, I ended up staying there for two years with Notts County, and uh, I was I was playing with Sean Dyer, who's the manager, and that's another club. I was there for two two years at Notts County, and they had I think they had eight managers at the time in in two years. Wow, so, uh, that's including the caretaker managers. So that's what happens with football clubs, like when when people come in and and. Uh, don't look after the club. And hopefully, they can get back up in the uh, football league. Hopefully, yeah, fingers crossed sooner or later. Absolutely. And after leaving Nottingham, uh, you stayed there between 2014 and 2016. At the age of 38, you went back to your your native homeland uh, to play for Linfield for the next three years of your career. Mm-hmm. When when you moved back to Northern Ireland, had it changed a lot since you'd left the whole uh, as a teenager? Yeah, it's changed a lot. Like uh, it's changed uh, for the good. Like uh, you don't get, you don't wake up like and uh, born on the news and say someone's been killed or uh, there's been a bomb blew up somewhere. But this day and age now, it's peaceful. It's peaceful. It's a lovely country, beautiful country. I don't know if any uh, if you've ever been over. It's a lovely country. And I've, I've been away. I was away for nearly twenty odd years. Like and it's just nice to be home. It's nice and relax. And it's uh, it's just great, especially living in the countryside. But uh, it's uh, it did change. It's changed a lot, like since I've left in ninety five. <laughs> but uh, during your time at Linfield, you spent three years there. Uh, how did you find yeah. uh, playing back in the League of Ireland? I uh, the Irish League. It was uh, to be fair when I moved back. Uh, it was it was uh, I knew it was going to be a tough league because it's it's a support time football league. You see, and. Uh, the players, uh, the players coming in, like uh, come back from England after being professional contracts, come back and they don't do too well because they're not open minded about the league. For me, I came back open minded about the league and I really enjoyed it. And uh, Linfield is the the biggest club in in Northern Ireland, and uh, they have the my first year back and we end up winning the league, which was fantastic. And I think it was the first time they won the league in five years. I think it was. Uh, don't quote me on that. I have to have a look at it and find out. But uh, it was it was quite a while since I won the league before, and it was a privilege, uh, really unbelievable to win the league again uh, for my first year back in Northern Ireland, and we won the the big cup as well. The Irish Cup was like the FA Cup at the end of the season uh, over here, and it was brilliant to win that as well in the first league. But the second season didn't go too good. Uh, we we missed out in the playoffs. Uh, we missed out in the Europe the second season, but the third year we ended up uh, winning the league again. So it was good, uh, three years, but uh, I got a bad injury and that's what stopped me playing for Linfield because I had a serious injury in my knee, it ruptured my ACL, which was a bad injury. <coughs> Touch wood, everything's all right now. That sounds uh, great to hear that the injury's uh, cleared up and, it, and it's doing well. Uh, are you now officially retired after leaving Linfield in 2019? Are you still open to playing? I'm playing for a team... Uh, FC Mainwell. It's a, a team what uh, some boys uh, opened up uh, during the uh, COVID nineteen league. Where first season this season, the lowest, this is right in the lowest league. Like you know what I mean? It's just a bunch of lads. Uh, it's all about uh, mental awareness. A team That's for cool. uh, people who uh, who who's been through uh, bad times and hard times, and and it's all about mental awareness. And we're trying to push it as much as we can in Northern Ireland. The FC Mainwell, it's called. So uh, great bunch of lads. Keith Gillespie's playing it as well. He used to play for Manchester United and Newcastle and the Northern Ireland legend. So uh, this, um, we're enjoying it. It's all about having a smile in your face and playing the game. 
and getting people out. Uh, we only train once a week, but them, the people who come training, they love it. They just want to get out of the house, even if it's only once or twice a week. And uh, we love every minute of it. That's absolutely brilliant. And, and it's great to hear that there's a, there's a team especially made for people with mental health and everyone's enjoying themselves playing football. And, and what are your plans, what are you up to at the moment? Um, obviously, amongst COVID, I know you mentioned uh, your coaching earlier on. What have you been up to with the, the coaching in Northern Ireland? Yeah, my, I've op- uh, my goalkeeping school, uh, I've opened a goalkeeping school over here, but um, it's been basically, I had it open for two years now, but it's not really two years because of this COVID. It's been a nightmare. It's been closed down for quite a while now with this uh, with the uh, lockdowns and uh, so anyhow the kids over here. Uh, oh, I'm coaching young kids from nine years old to sixteen year olds, and I want the next uh, want the next Pat Jennings goalkeeper coming out of Northern Ireland. Try and get them not not just in England or Scotland. I want them. Uh, that's what makes me. That's what I'm trying to say to young players. If you can't make it in England or Scotland, don't worry. There's all other places you can go. You know what I mean. I never thought I'd be playing in Greece. Uh, I never thought I'd be playing in Denmark. You know what I mean? There's football. Football's all all over the world. So if you if you if you have a bad time in England, you can't make it in England. Don't worry. There's other places to go. And uh, that's what I'm trying to coach kids the the believe in themselves because being a goal being a goalkeeper, it's very it's a lonely place, and. Uh, it's just you and the coach as a goalkeeper, the goalkeeper and the goalkeeping coach, and it's a lonely place. So you have you have to be very mentally strong and uh, believe in yourself is the main thing as well. That's uh, some great pieces of advice for any young goalkeeper. And one thing that's always intrigued me is: do you have any managerial ambitions? Because I knew uh, you led Barnet back in 2011 uh, to hmm. the Heart Senior Club Cup <laughs> Final uh, victory against Stevenage. You hold the most unusual honour. Of having won a trophy in your, your only ever game as a manager, some start. I'm retired, you see now, so that's me retired. <laughs> I don't have to come back to management. <laughs> no, you don't. You can have the most perfect record. It, it matches Sir Alex, uh, Sir Alex, uh, Sam Ardice's uh, record for England of, of one game, one bit, because it's record, no goals conceded. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think one thing to, to end the podcast, and one thing we have to talk about is that despite having a fantastic club career, you play for 11 clubs, featured for the likes of Wig Athletic, Manchester United, West Ham. You also played 45 times for your country between 1997 and 2017. What was it like to play for your country? No, oh, a dream come through. I know that a lot of people probably, but it does. It's, uh, I, I love my country. I love Northern Ireland. Uh, I love Northern Ireland football team and it's just fantastic. I wish I had more caps. That's the only downfall. I wish I had more caps. But came here. I played forty-seven times for my club, um, for my country. I'm very proud of that. And uh, once we uh, qualified for the major tournament in two thousand sixteen, that was that was really, really, really hard for me when we lost against Wales because I never thought I would have been sitting on the uh, on the bench in the major tournament for Northern Ireland after what I went through. It was it was. I had a tear in my eye, and it was tough, tough tough to take like but uh, I enjoyed every minute of it and uh, uh, especially when I used to watch Pat Jennings back in the day like and have them Northern Ireland tops in there the, hanging up in the wall it's fantastic to look at when, you, when you're getting old and grey <laughs> Absolutely and what was it like to experience uh, the Euros in, in 2016? It was uh, see our fans our Northern Ireland fans I told you about party and like our fans are oh brilliant um, I remember when we were playing at Windsor High and we, we only had six, 7,000 fans. Now we're having 19,000 fans. And uh, it's just like the roof's being ripped off. Uh, ripped off. Eh? The noise they make is unbelievable. Uh, the only time I've ever heard fans like that is the Olympiagos fans. When the when Olympiagos fans sing, they're, they're just so loud. But Northern Ireland in, in the Euros 2016, they were fantastic. Credit to them. Uh, the best, Credit to the Northern Ireland fans and uh, uh, enjoyed every minute listening to them singing and, and singing and shouting and especially when we qualified out of the the group stage out of the out of the group stage into the knockout stage it was fantastic for us it, it was really special i always remember that european <coughs> championships campaign because uh the song will griggs on fire 
was very mm-hmm. popular. That's Lattic right, yeah. Days. The Wigan Athletic striker, he just had a great season, scored 28 goals as Lattic got promoted to League One in the 2015-16 campaign. And I think one one question that's always uh, intrigued Wigan fans is, why did Will Grigg not feature at that tournament? Because it, it was uh, very strange from the outside to see someone in such good form not be given an opportunity hmm. to play. See, that's not, uh, it's not for me to answer, like, but uh, it was a great song, though, wasn't it? <laughs> no, but you're right. Yeah, I don't definitely. know why. I don't know why. I don't know why it was. But uh, I know what you're saying. He scored a lot of goals for Wigan. Uh, got them promoted. So I forgot Will was. There. I forgot about that. Great song. I love that song. <laughs> the set. The. Uh, I thought like if I was the manager, I'd probably stuck him on for the last five minutes against Wales, and the fans would have went mad. It would have been brilliant uh, to get him on the pitch. But I don't know. Uh, Michael Michael O'Neill. Uh, Picks the team like and great manager. He's he's done wonders, Michael O'Neill for Northern Ireland. What since he's came, uh, since he came in and uh, he's moved on now to Stoke City. But uh, um, it's probably because he had the likes of Kyle Lafferty and uh, strikers in front of him. But uh, as you say, Will Gregg was probably top in form that year, scoring so many goals. So you never know. You don't know what's behind the scenes, do you? No, uh, that's uh, very true. And. To, to recap this podcast, you've been an excellent guest, uh, really insightful, some great stories. And uh, I think the, the one question I always like to ask my guests is, what is your biggest career highlight and what is your biggest career regret? Hmm. I've got a lot of highlights because well, the first one was being a professional footballer, you know what I mean? But uh, it's probably it's probably the biggest, basically the biggest one for me was playing from Northern Ireland. I know it's Winning the Premier League's good, but uh, playing from a country, as I said before, that's the biggest. Absolutely, and it's a, a great achievement. And I think one question that would be quite intriguing, knowing what you're doing now in, in Northern Ireland with your coaching, obviously having had that mm. coaching experience now, knowing what you know now, what career advice would you give the 19-year-old Roy Carroll who signed for Wigan in 1997? What advice? Keep focus on that track, train track. Some guy told a guy told me ten years ago, fifteen what was it five years ago, you're going to be on a track, follow that track the whole way down the track. If you come off it, you have to get back on it as quick as possible. Keep focus, stay on that track. If you understand what I'm saying, Jay. Yeah, it's a brilliant advice. Always stay on that same path. Always keep working towards the same goal. Is that the message you're trying to uh, send across? Yeah, that's the one. Stay on that. Uh, that train track, that straight train track, just go straight down that train track. And sometimes you might pop, come off it once in a while, get back on it as quick as possible. Because uh, for a 19 year old Roy Carroll, uh, I, I did come off that track a few times, but I got back together again. Absolutely. And this question is going to be quite a, a great one. I know you're going to have a, a great team for this, but if you can pick a five a side team from the players you played with in your career, what would it be? Oh, you can include yourself. But, uh, you never said this one. I'm gonna put the. Uh, I'm gonna put the uh, rail at the back. Uh, this is a hard one, mate. It's gonna be all man you for players as well, by the way. Yeah, and you, can you blame? I can't blame you for that Premier League winning side. A lot of good players at the time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have to add this. So I'm not gonna put a goalkeeper in, you know. <laughs> Rio Ferdinand in goal he's played there before uh, I know I'm going to go Rio Scolzi Roy Keane and this is the one here I'm going to go for Ruth Vanessa Roy and I'm going to go from uh, I'm bumping myself in I, back, I, don't play I like playing get, I, like, I like playing with them four players I, I can't they, there were some great great names there so many legends of the footballing game. And I'd like to thank you so much today for being a guest, uh, being the first podcast of 2021. It's been excellent to hear your stories. Uh, I always like to ask, is there anything you'd like to plug at the end of the podcast or is there any messages you'd like to send uh, after this podcast? No, I just want to wish all the Wigan fans all the best and uh, look after yourselves and take care and stay safe. Enjoy this episode of the Full Time Whistle podcast with Roy Carroll. Please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to Atmos Rent. It's a new gymwear company based in the northwest of England. It's a great company. The website's really good. It's just launched last Wednesday. So uh, please check it out. I'll leave a link in the description down below. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys later.